Hey everybody, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for the week of October 14th, 2015. Yeah, I'm still around, baby. And man, oh man, uh, shaking the camera. I got a large stack to review here. Just move that little helper over here. We're going to start with Indies, then go through Marvel, and end with DC. Start the Indies off with uh, Chapter House Comics. We're looking at Captain Canuck, number four. Uh, the creative team that are working on this, they're doing a really good job with this. Now, I admit, I didn't read any of Captain Canuck's stories from, the, from yesteryear. I didn't. So, this is a new character for me, in that respect. But in here, first of all, like I said, that is a badass cover. But in here, we're getting to see more stuff that happened in Captain Canuck and his brother Michael's past. We get to see more of that unfolding as the story progresses. And we learn a few things about the brothers. Primarily how how one of them was able to actually fight off a polar bear. So, you know, just more stuff's going on. But the main antagonist, Mr. Gold, what a bastard. I mean, this stuff is really good stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to give everything away. I'm not trying to go into depth, into detail, because I really think this is a series that needs to be checked out. I really think this is a series that needs to be looked at and needs to be admired for what it is. Uh, not bad. This was really good, and I really enjoyed it. Not perfect, but a damn good read. I give it a 3.5. Moving on to IDW, we got Jim and the Holograms, number 8. Um, wow, this is, um, this was a fun issue. This was fun. You know, it's like, they have, the girls have a conversation about synergy, and you know what kind of what kind of tool she would be if somebody if synergy were to be were to have fallen into the wrong hands <clears throat> and even synergy herself tells the girls you need to take care of me because if the wrong person gets a hold of me things could go wrong fast meanwhile the little hacker that a certain someone hires to hack into the holograms you know, accounts on his computer and he's going through hell because he can't hack it. He can't get through. He can't get through the encryptions and it's driving him mad. And, but he's at the same time, he's looking at it as his greatest challenge and blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, you've got the misfits having their own little plan with the holograms, including... Well, I think I should go ahead and stop it right there because I don't want to give everything away. This was this was fun. This was cute, fun, adorable, all that cute shit. And I really enjoyed it. Thought it was a nice read. I give it a 3.5 as well. Damn train. <sighs> Moving on to Dynamite and Dark Horse with issue 3 of Red Sonja Conan. Victor Gishler, who just recently started following me on Twitter. Thank you, Mr. G uh, Gishler. I really appreciate it. Uh, but this is some phenomenal stuff, and i got to love that Ed Bennis cover. Just, woohoo. I'll say it again. I love how Gishler captures Sonya and Conan's relationship. They're trusted friends. It's like a friends with benefits kind of deal. You know, and I, I know I've said this before, but it feels I feel like it needs to be said again. I love how, he, you know how he captures this. It's like a friends with benefits type of deal, but they're more respectful towards each other when the time calls for it. And I thought that's, I think that's a really nice way to put it. But towards the end of the issue, we get to get to see a bit of a, one of those endings has been, one of those twists in the story that's been done before where you think you know who the main antagonist is, then boom. We get to see who the true main antagonist is going to end up being. 
for this series. And that's all I'm going to say there. This was good. This was really good. It gets a solid three and a half. Alright, we're ending the Indies with Dynamite. We're ending it with Swords of Sorrow, number six. Gail Simone, my lady, my friend. Uh, ooh, first of all, I, I love that cover. It's so, so cute. I love it. This is what this whole series has been building up. This is the culmination of this entire arc. All the tie-ins, all the build-up has been leading to this. And did it deliver? Yes, it did. Was it a 100% home run or grand slam? Not quite, but for what it is, thought it was good. Thought it was handled really well. All the ladies working together very well. Uh, you know, they hardly know they they hardly know each other that well. They haven't really had time to get fully acquainted with each other. It was basically the whole buildup was, hey. I'm so-and-so, how are you doing? Let's go fight. You know, that's pretty much how it was. And it was, you know, and Gail Simone tried her best to, you know, build this up with all the tie-ins and one-shots and everything that was tying into the storyline. She really tried her best, and I think she did a good job. Now, if she was handling this story all by herself, with all, without all the tie-ins, who knows? Maybe it could have been differently. But she really, you could tell she really did honestly try. And it shows in here. And how, how the battle is won, I'm not going to give that away. I thought, for what it was, I thought they did a good job. The artwork is solid. The characters are done very well. And I, <laughs> I geeked out a bit when I saw Sonya tell somebody, wait till, you, wait till I tell you about this arachnid fellow I met. <laughs> <laughs> Winking a nod to Spider-Man <laughs> in a fucking dynamite book written by a girl who works at DC. <laughs> awesome. Uh, but in all seriousness, this was a good book. Not not one of Gail Simone's best storylines. I will be honest about that. You know, you know. But for what she had to deal with. And this is something she wanted to do. And it shows. It really does. And I thought this was a satisfying conclusion to the story. It was. I thought it really was. I give it a 3.5. Moving on to Marvel. We're starting off Marvel with A-Force number 5. Marjorie Bennett and Marjorie Wilson. This is the conclusion to the five-part mini-series done through Secret Wars. And I'm going to go ahead and state right now, yeah, I know A-Force is relaunching here very, very soon. And I have decided to pass on it. Some other stuff is coming up, and I can only afford so much, so I'm going to have to pass on it. Uh, if anybody wants to send me digital codes for it, I'm all for that. But as far as A-Force goes, yeah, this is where I, this is where I stop, even though I did like this. I thought the storyline wrapped up very well. Loved the loved the scene where Spider Gwen rescues MJ from a zombie. I thought that was really good. Thought that was really well handled. Thought that was really well played. The rest of the characters they just worked real nicely together. I thought this was a really good conclusion. And there is minor spoiler here. There is a heroic sacrifice at the end of the book and it hits everybody it just hits everybody right there but I'm not gonna spoil who it was this was a satisfying conclusion I really dug it I thought it was good I give it a 3.5 moving on to Guardians of the Galaxy number one yeah this Guardians of the Galaxy has been relaunched so many times it's hard to tell what the traditional numbering up of it is anymore it's easier to keep track of with Amazing Spider-Man, but, uh... And, Guardians of the Galaxy, number one. I, I, I was, I already knew I was going to get this anyway, but 
I was even further intrigued with the team lineup. You got, you go, you got your Groot, you got Drax, you got Venom, you got Rocket, who is now leading the team. And my bro Chris, he, I watched his review here recently. <laughs> uh, my girlfriend off camera goofing off, <laughs> but you know, he, he was right. This is not the first time Rocket has led the team. But what really caught my attention was Kitty Pride and Ben Grimm, the Thing, being a part of this team. Now, Kitty being on the team, that's not surprising. I mean, that's Peter Quill's fiance, but the Thing, that really caught my attention. I'm like, okay, this could really go somewhere. And I, too, laughed at the bit. We're going to do the Thing, and Ben's like, what? <laughs> that was really good. But we get to see Peter Quill. What's he up to? And seeing him as king, I don't think I've ever seen royalty so goddamn bored out of their mind. And it's like he's even starting to talk to himself, go, geez, no wonder my dad went insane. Look what he had to deal with. But then the book ends with my lady Gamora entering the scene. And I'm stopping right there because I don't want to ruin what's going on. I don't want to ruin what the Guardians are doing. And why Gamora came in the way she did. Thought this was a really strong new beginning that's really a continuation of what's already been going on. So, yeah, it is what it is. Strong, strong book. Really dug it. Really liked it. And the cliffhanger just made me want to keep on reading. Good stuff. Uh... I think I'll go ahead and uh, give it a four. Thought it was that good. Next up, Radioactive Spider Gwen. Spider Gwen number one. Ugh, fuck. For those of you keeping track, this is actually number six because this, like, like my bro said, this is not a relaunch. This is a continuation from what we have already been reading. Marvel sometimes just pisses me off to no to no end with their constant lust for renumbering shit. I mean, they it, it seems like they have a lust for it. It's like just renumber everything to number one. Ha 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 ha! Just do it. It's like every time Marvel renumbers something back to number one, joke was out of blows a load in his pants. Uh, it just. Okay, whatever. This is issue number six. And we get to see what... We get a flashback as to, you know, this particular world's relationship was between Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy. And interesting fact that Peter, yes, was the lizard. He was the lizard. The original lizard in here. And we get to see what's going on. All the shit that Captain George Stacy is going through. You know, knowing his daughter is Spider-Woman and all that stuff. But the way the book ends, you know, Chris already semi-spoiled it, so you probably already know what's going on. But the end of the it, the end of the book actually made me go, hmm, interesting. I like that. Where are we going with this? This was a solid read. Give it a 3.5. Alright, moving on. To this book damn near came close to being my pick of the week with something, I mean, just barely beat it out. Spider-Man 2099, number one. Again, re relaunched so many times. But, you know, it, you know, whatever. Again, another continuation instead of a relaunching. So, you know. Uh, but Peter David and Mr. Sliney, I mean, everybody who worked on this. This was fantastic. This was really good. You know, Miguel has seemingly quit being Spider-Man. You know, he's now, you know, working for Parker Industries. And I love the way the the issue began with him being on this Ninja Warrior-esque type of TV show. And he's completely showing off. And Peter's like, mm, think, Miguel. People are going to put two and two together. You know, they're going to figure out who you were. You know, and stuff. And Miguel's like, Pete, I got this. Don't worry about it. And we find out what Miguel is up to at Parker Industries. In fact, he's able to access a room to where he's able to constantly go back and check on his future, the, 20, the year 2099, and see if there's anything he needs to do to fix it because he still does not have a true home to go back to. So he's like, ah, oh, damn, what have I got to go back and fix now? So he's thinking, 
goes back to the goes back to our time does something go back and check still nothing gotta go back and do something else I like that it's like he can just go back and check nope go back go back and check nope go back I like that I like that it adds to the tension but then what really sold this book for me was the ending Miguel and his girlfriend sitting down having an in-depth conversation and Chris has already semi spoiled it but all I'm gonna say is Peter David God bless you you master of suspenseful cliffhangers Jesus Christ what a cliffhanger this was amazing this was really good I give this a solid four maybe even a 4.5 that's stretching it a bit but it definitely earns a 4 out of 5 for me ending Marvel with Star Wars Shattered Empire number 3 oh boy uh, this is this was surprisingly well done uh, uh, you know it, I, I guess I really shouldn't be surprised that Emperor Palpatine had a, you know a contingency plan just in case he failed just in case him and Vader failed. And the contingency plan that he had, I'm not going to go into great detail as to what it is, but it involves fucking with Naboo. Oh, man. He had things ready for when he kicked the bucket. This was good. Uh, the, all, the, all the main characters in here shine very well. No sign of Luke Skywalker at all in this book, and I think that's a good thing. You want to focus on other characters besides the core characters that we've already known. You want to focus on new characters because you're introducing Star Wars to new viewers and to a newer audience, and this is the way you want to go. If you want to see those core characters that we've grown up with over the years, just have them go back and watch the original shit. Here, you have a chance to expand on your new characters, get new viewers invested in these new characters to the point where they become just as identifiable as the characters of yesteryear. I really dug this. Thought this was really handled well. Uh, this, has, this has potential to be a, a solid hit, and I'm hoping it's getting a lot of attention. Cons well, considering it's a Star Wars-related book, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, but... Surprisingly well handled, well done, well written. The artwork was great, including including a scene. My favorite scene in this issue involved Leia feeling a chill in the air. And what it was that made her feel that chill just made me go, whoa. That's fucking heavy. This was good. A really good book. This gets a four. Moving on to DC with Batman number 45. Scott Snyder, Greg Capula. Uh, we're finally getting back on the focus on James Gordon and his ordeal with, you know, trying to be a good Batman while trying to figure out what's going on with Mr. Bloom and stuff. In this issue, minor spoilers in here, but in this issue, Jim Gordon is basically getting fired by the GCPD. But they say your last mission is to find a suitable replacement. And I was like, <laughs> Shit, there's gratefulness for you. You know, Gordon was changing his life around. He was getting better. He was, you know, trying to live up to the mantle of Batman, and you're just going to fucking fire him? But they're not dicks about it. They're, they're, you know, you can tell by the way they're talking to him. They're concerned, you know, that this, this job could end up getting him killed. In fact, at the beginning of the issue, it damn near does. You know, no focus on Bruce Wayne or any of that stuff. We're focusing on James Gordon, Batman. This is where they need to go. And the way the issue ends is Mr. Bloom plays his next role in the story. Oh, shit. <laughs> this was good. This was really good. The artwork is solid. The writing is good. You know... Call me crazy. I like Gordon as Batman. I think he think he does a good job with it. Now, we all know it's not going to be permanent. We all know that want, that sooner or later, probably sooner, DC's going to write some bullshit story to get Gordon out of the suit and get Bruce right back in it. They can't help themselves. Nothing's forever unless your name is Bruce fucking Wayne. 
Um, but yeah, solid read. I dug it. Thought it was great. 3.5. Moving on to Bombshells, number three. DC Comics Bombshells. Um, once again, story splits. You got all kinds of stuff going on. You first have a Batwoman story, then you got a Zatanna story, and then you end it with Wonder Woman and Mira. For me, easily the first story was the best one. The Batwoman story. I, I love how Marjorie Bennett I love how she writes this character. I really do. And I was like, man. Man, when J.H. Williams III left the Batwoman title, they should have put they should have put Miss Bennett on the title instead of Mark and Draco, because and Draco ruined that character. And here you got somebody like Bennett who's writing this character the way she should be written as a badass and a damn good one at that. Just really, really good stuff. Then you got the stuff with Zatanna. That stuff was all right. Thought it was really good uh, for the most part. I think the Zatanna stuff was for me the weakest part of the book, but that's not saying it was bad. Then you got the stuff with Wonder Woman and Mira, and her, and when she's talking to Steve Trevor, she calls him by his full name. It's like, what do we do, Steve Trevor? It's like, Mira, you go over here. I'll take Steve Trevor over here. It's like God. It's like calling him Steve Trevor like his name is Steve Trevor, all one word. It's like, it's like, Steve Trevor, get over here. <laughs> it's so silly. I, I laughed my ass off at that. I'm laughing in that now. Um, a solid read. I, I thought it was fun for what it was. It was good. I give it a 3.5. See that, folks? He's back. You're up, dude. Is I the Earth 2 <clears throat> Blue Goblin, as you can plainly see. And I'm here to talk about my book. Or a book about my world. This is Earth 2 Society, number 5. I gotta say, in terms of storytelling, this is definitely a step up in the right direction. The artwork is still... Still has a lot left to be desired. We're going all over the place with this new Earth. I didn't know Batman could pull off purple, but young Richard wants to have his own unique flavor to the Dark Knight, and that's all good and well. But the main selling point is the Flash, and all the stuff that the Flash goes through. Young Mr. Garrick has decided that he is indeed a celebrity as well as a hero. Yet, his ego is not really that big of a problem because he is, he does act more like a hero than a celebrity in this book, which is very fitting to a man like him. But as the story goes on, and we are reminded of Superman's inability to perform 24 hours a day, we get a good look at who the true bad guy may end up being. And I gotta say, I gotta say, I'm really intrigued on where this could end up going. True, this is still not as strong as Mr. Taylor's run was, or Mr. Robinson's run for that matter. But they are trying, and I commend them for it. Very much so. I gotta say, I'm impressed. Not to the point where I'm, as you people would call it, fanboying and nerdgasming or whatever the hell you say nowadays, but to be a gentleman, I will say that DC did a good job with this. Could have done a little bit better, but then again, that's just my humble and honest opinion. I give this book three and a half out of five. You're welcome for the entertainment. Back to you, Mr. Blue Primer. Whatever you like to be called. Farewell, my friends. We shall meet again. Okay. Kind of digging this guy over the previous R2 Blue Goblin, even though this new one seems to be a little bit on the mysterious side. I don't know. 
But you heard what he said, you know, and I, I basically agree. There you go. Moving on to Harley Quinn number 21. Yeah, I know this had two different covers, and I had to go with this one. This one was just fucking nuts. I love, I love The Shining. The Jack Nicholson classic, I love it. But in here, in here we get to see Harley working with Deadshot, and I fucking love their, their working relationship in this issue. It's like, Harley knows that this, that this motherfucker can you know, blow her head off anytime he wants to, but she just doesn't care. She's just, like, gonna fuck with him just as much as he would probably fuck with her. You know, it's just one of those things. And you have a hilarious scene with Harley uh, getting massage and, you know, having a casual conversation with somebody uh, butt naked. And she's even told, would you please put some clothes on? She's like, no. And great um uh, really good really good story a really good issue really dug it thought it was very nicely handled uh, this gets a 3.5 as well justice league of america number four uh yeah not much to say about this one it's kind of going in a predictable pattern you know you got you got a, a savior who's worshipped, and then we're uh, unfortunately going to find out he's not really the savior he claims to be, and blah, 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 blah. But the only thing, the only part of the storytelling that really got my attention was the stuff with Superman. And, you know, implying that Rao's programming, you know, his, Rao's brainwashing, as I'll say it, you know, was put into Superman much sooner than than he realizes. And it's just, you, you know, the stuff with Hal, with Green Lantern, that stuff was pretty interesting. I thought that was pretty well done. It's just that this storyline is just, other than that, it's not really, you know, it's not really grabbing me, you know, it's just, I feel like it should be. But I'm going to stick with it because I am interested in seeing where the story, <clears throat> excuse me, where the story goes and how it will inevitably conclude. You know, it's just, I just feel like it could be better. I give this a three. I'll be nice and give it a three. Just barely above average. Pig of the Week. Pig of the Week goes to Superman, Lois and Clark, number one. Okay. Old school Superman and Lois back together, married with a child, check. Dan Jurgens on writing, check. Lee Weeks artwork, check. Three for three, baby. This is a homer. Fucking loved it. This was great. This is old school Superman. This is like pre-52 Superman. And he's actually stranded him, Lois, and their son are actually stranded in the New 52 universe, in the New 52 world, the New 52 Earth. They're stuck there. In fact, old school Superman, it's revealed in the beginning of the issue that he nearly revealed himself during the big fight between the Justice League and Dark Side of the New 52. He nearly did, but he didn't. But he was watching. And we get to see, you know... Clark, Lois and Clark, they take on they have taken on new identities. They are not the Kents. Lois is still writing, but she goes by author X. Doesn't want to go public. And they go by the name White. Their last name is now White, and their son's name is Jonathan. They're trying to keep a low profile because they don't want to reveal who they really are because they're afraid that if that would ever happen, shit would hit the fan. I love the way Dan Jurgens writes this. I love the pacing. I love the character development. I loved everything about this. This was captivating. This was good. You get to see Clark, old school Superman, still being the hero that he is while trying to keep it low. And the stuff that he discovers about the new 5-2 Earth, primarily the fact that humans do not trust superheroes on this earth they don't even trust this version of superman they really don't 
they're really skeptical. They're thinking that these so-called superheroes are trying to pass themselves off as gods. And the Superman that I grew up with, the main Superman of this storyline, he's like, what the hell has happened to the heroes? Yeah, and he's also trying to stop you know, certain events from happening. One of them involves a legendary Superman villain that I'm not going to reveal, even though my bro Chris did reveal it. <laughs> uh, but this was an amazing beginning to the to a series. I'm glad I decided to pick this up. This was awesome. Fucking loved it. This easily gets a four. Just like Spider-Man 2099, it's a four, maybe, just maybe a 4.5. Fucking awesome. I loved it. We're ending this with Starfire number five. Um, oh boy. Uh, best thing about this is the cover. Uh, it's still, it's still more of the same stuff. Starfire being naively dumb, yet everybody just loves her and just falls at her feet. It's just, uh, it's getting monotonously repetitive. The formula they keep going with. I said it before. And I'll say it again, you don't need to write this series in a similar fashion to the way you write Harley Quinn. It works for Harley Quinn. But let me tell you something, Princess Coriander is not fucking Harley Quinn. Mm, you need to write this character in her own unique way. And the same thing goes with the series. It's like the, the cutesy wootsy humor just doesn't fully work with me. But the the stuff the only thing that really captured my attention was where they might possibly be going with the main antagonist, and that's pretty much it. I mean, it's good to see uh, Atlee, you know, Tara. It's good to see her again. But other than that, this was just kind of eh. I'm only staying loyal to this series because I'm loyal to Starfire. She was my first superheroine. My very first one. And you never really forget your first, folks. So, this... This sadly comes off as an average read. At best, it gets a 2.5. I'm sorry. That's all I got for this review, everybody. And it's a long one. And I'm glad it's done. <laughs> so now it's time for me to focus on next week's comics. So until then, stay subscribed to this channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, then go ahead and do it. You won't regret it, I promise. There's also Blue Goblin X. I've got a few things I want to do for that channel. As soon as I can find the time to do it, I will see if I can get it done. Don't forget Arkham Asylum Studio. Big shout out to my bro, Chris, the Mount Vernon kid. I, as always, I leave the link to his comic book review channel in the description below. Follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Facebook, or here on YouTube. Do whatever you want, as long as you enjoy the show. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I am Groot, and I'll see y'all later.